Well, that morning we were at that time when the first plane struck at 846. We were in the firehouse in Brooklyn and uh, one of our new guys, Kevin Riley, had come running out of the uh, locker room and he said a plane hit the World Trade Center. A few minutes later, our, our alarm system went off and we knew it had to be something significant to move from Brooklyn into Manhattan. And all it said was respond to one World Trade Center, commercial plane into building. And once we pulled out of the firehouse, you could see the smoke in the air. That was the holy shit factor of, wow, this is big. My name is Bobby Sen. I worked in downtown Brooklyn in engine 207, ladder 110, battalion 31. And seeing the top 20 floors of a high-rise building on fire was um, surreal, frightening, but you just knew it was game on. The first thoughts in my head are, wow, we're gonna die. Like this, it, you just, we knew what we, know what you're going into. My name is Dan Crenshaw. I was a Navy SEAL for 10 years from 2006 to 2016. Now I serve as a member of Congress. So you pull up here, you get we, out. We got out, it was 8.58. I hit the on scene button, got out, started to put our stuff on, and there was about hundreds, hundreds of people all piled up in the street here, staring up this way at the North Tower burning. Right. I mean, I was kind of looking forward this way Heard that rush of air, that huge noise, just boom. That's when people started to panic and run. Because yeah, then now it you know started to purpose. kick in. Did you see that right from there. here? Right, right from here. Um, you could feel the ground shake, people screaming, running away, and then it started a stampede, actually. So this is strange energy rush of adrenaline that you would get going to a fire, you're excited to get there, excited to operate, excited to do your job. Here's the fire department and what we go to. Car accidents, um, you know, some industrial accidents, fires, and then there's 9-11 and it's like all the way out in left field somewhere disconnected. I mean, going into the building, going towards the building, the commitment level was the same whether you were going to the magnitude of September 11th or a four-story apartment building. I went straight down Liberty to try to make a right turn to get into the to the North Tower. The Burger King, when I pass it now, it's it's a Burger King again. For a while that had been a temporary morgue. People, People have, have no idea. Somebody's sitting there eating a you know a burger and had no idea what was in there 20 years ago. My dad was in the oil business, so we were actually living abroad at the time. I didn't I didn't get to experience it with my fellow Americans. I was a, uh, I guess a junior in high school. I think like many people, it, it didn't, we didn't understand the magnitude of it at the time. You start moving this way. I was running right down the middle of the street. And what, what's the goal from a, from a firefighter perspective? Well, it's a, right, is that, um, is that accurate? The intent was to just get from where we arrived to get inside and get inside the North Tower because that's what our assignment was. In the process of coming down Liberty Street, there used to be a hotel there, it was a Marriott Hotel. Right here? Uh, on the far corner of West Street in Liberty. Okay. And there was a guy standing there who worked there. He was like waving for someone to come in and help him. Instead of making a right turn and going up the, the sidewalk, my right turn was into the, into the lobby of the hotel. And there was about a dozen civilians in there. So what happened was we made a quick decision, myself and a police officer, like let's get him out of here. And those people lived. But the reflecting pools that are there are exactly where the buildings stood. Those are the exact footprints. But in terms of like the things that were going through my head during that was thinking of people who had to make a decision, a terrible decision to jump. It's like, why were these people jumping? Why weren't they just waiting? And the science of it is this. Roast beef starts to cook at 310, and so do we. The temperature up there was well over 1,000 degrees. It was standing right at the corner behind where we are now and just looking up and that was actually seeing the first two jumpers that I witnessed come down. They look this big up in a window and the only reason why I noticed is there was a woman on the corner and she was holding her face and she was like going like this and she's going no, 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 no. And it was a man and a woman. He had a suit, she had a dress on. It was a light pinkish colored dress uh, and they just looked at each other, held hands, and just stepped out. It was horrifying. And when they landed, um, it was, I, wo I wo have woken up 
at least 100 times over the last 20 years having dreams about that or uh, nightmares about that. And then you're just up. You know, all right, it's coffee time. No, no going back to sleep. No, it's life changing. You know, your mortality is is uh, scratched to the you know to the nerves watching that go on. Uh, and it's helpless, absolutely helpless feeling. These people, nobody died a a painless death that day. Everybody, it was you know it was pretty horrific for them. The goal is to just get to the command post in the North Tower, just from. This street here, Liberty Street, down to Vesey Street, there were bodies strewn all over the street, and they were landing everywhere. So I came out of the hotel, worked my way through fire trucks, and <clears throat> so I got in there. In the lobby, back and forth, frustrated. I heard the mayday come for Danny Sura. At that time, Mike Judge, the department chaplain, was uh, in the lobby with us. They wanted to get him out of the lobby to get over to what was going on over there with Danny. You couldn't come back out the front because of everything that was raining down out here. So while we were standing there trying to get him out, heard a rumble, Billy started to shake, and all of a sudden it started getting dark. Like you could see that in like a couple of seconds. I'm right in the lobby on the inside of this building, right up against the glass. I got picked up and blown off to the left. I bounced off the wall on the inside over there and wound up underneath the lobby command desk. Then the debris coming in was just like, it was like a payloader, you know, like a big scoop coming in and just dropping, hot, moist, not really heavy. It was like getting uh, a big thing of sand dumped on you, but it was super, super hot. And it reeked of jet fuel. Could not breathe, could not see trying to put my face piece with my mask to my face to get some air in, and all I'm doing is pressurizing all of that debris and inhaling it. Just started moving, trying to move, trying to push whatever it was on me, off of me. I started crawling along that wall, and that's when I first heard other, other people that were guys who had survived it. Fast forward, we wind up going up, going across. We get into that building, and now, I'm in that building, but I still think I'm in this building. I have no idea you know, yeah. where I am. Come out, there was a there were fire apparatus all over this street. And uh, one of our chiefs says, comes up, and he goes, guys, you, I want you to get out of here, and I want you to go north. <laughs> I run into some guys over there, and they're like, don't go this way, go back the other way. I walk back over here, I get to the corner back over here, and there's a guy standing there just hanging up his cell phone. I said, can I borrow your phone for a minute? I called my wife at work, and I said my exact words. She says, are you there? I says, yeah, we're here. I don't know if we're going to come home. I just need you to know that I love you. I hung up the phone, I handed this guy his cell phone back, and his head spun around and looked up. And you can see the distance where the North Tower is at that height to the corner. And I. My head snapped back and I looked up, and all I saw was the building start to twist at the top ever so slightly, and then the top 30, 40 floors just li literally liquefied. They just started to just break apart and it started coming down. And I grabbed that guy and I said, holy shit, it's coming down, and I just pushed him in the direction we were going. I got to that corner and it picked me up and it threw me up the block like Superman. Slammed into a fence, face down, and then all you heard was the steel slamming into the ground and hit it. And I just covered up and then it stopped. And then it was from crazy insanity and noisy to dead silent. Everything you inhaled, you vomited and choked on. I stumbled and walked from that corner, and I got two and a half blocks down, and a police officer says, I got you, brother, and he stands me up, walks me over, and I go, I can't see and I can't breathe, and he took me over to an open fire hydrant. I was able to wash my face off a little bit. I turn around from doing that 
and the guys from my firehouse are standing right next to me. How, how many guys from your firehouse didn't make it? A total of seven. Uh, the entire engine company was killed except for the guy driving the chauffeur. 50, engine 54 <clears throat> and ladder four, they lost the whole firehouse. They lost 17 guys. Squad 288 and Hazmat, they lost 17 or 18 guys. Um, now, 10 and 11 guys was like a normal number. After 9-11, for the first year, you were either at work, at the pile, working, digging, um, helping out with a family, or doing something, something related to September 11th. Is it just debris, just moving debris and wheelbarrows out? I mean, what are we doing? In the beginning, it was just a, like, four or five story pile, which is why it became called the pile. Each individual one mounded up this way. Anybody who spent any amount of time down here, um, you're sick. Cancers, asthma, I mean, the list goes on. What, um, what about you? What happened? Is, you said you mentioned some health problems. I have asthma, COPD, reactive airway disease, and a condition called uh, bronchiectasis, where all your bronchioles start to enlarge, which makes it harder to, uh, to cough and, and um, and to get rid of anything that you're sick with. Yeah. That's me, but you could add thousands of guys who have that. You get involved in, in that business, the fire business, yeah. the police business, the military. Um, you're not doing it to get rich. You're not doing it for, for you. It's very self-fulfilling, but there's a give aspect of it. Anybody who's a fireman or police officer or works in any capacity who's down here, we don't need to never forget because I, we have days where we're just like, oh my God, I just want to forget for a day. Yeah. The never forget thing is for everybody else. Right. Even the anniversary. Um, the anniversary is not for me. It's for those who died and it's for everybody else to take a minute out and go, okay, it could have been me. It could have been the building I was in. It could have been my family. You know, people ask, what do we get for the last 20 years? All this warfare, all of this all of this money spent, all of the taxpayer dollars spent, all of our equipment lost. But you got no more 9-11s. That's what you got. And that's a pretty good deal. That's not nothing. People forget that. 